Well, we have made it to our last week of threads. Everybody that came back, you get an automatic A, all right? Even after, even after we told you last week, you knew this was the final. So uh, if you studied and got ready for the final, you get an A just, just, just for being here tonight. So easy, easy professor here. He, he'll... he'll um, <laughs> give give you a passing grade, but welcome. I've it's never given it. oh, is this on? See if it... there we go. There you go. I've never given an exam. This will be fun. I thought about it. I thought it'd be good for an exam, but I don't know about this group. I don't know how well they <laughs> study or how well they pay attention. I'm just not sure. <laughs> but I think they've done pretty well. Hasn't this been good? This has been exciting for us to get to do this uh, as, as a team, really, over these, um, this is week 13 um, Wait, of, of you're, Threads. You're staying up here? I'm going to stay up here with you tonight, just to keep you in uh, line, because okay. I didn't really plan on if that. We, if we leave you to your own devices, there's no telling what worthless John, I mean, Gary Cook, will, um, will do tonight. I'm so just going to sit and listen. <laughs> And if you Somebody. say the right thing, I'll go, okay, but if not, I'll... All right, so I'm going to ask that you pray for me tonight, because <laughs> uh, I drew the, um, <laughs> the short straw. You said it, not me, but yeah, somebody said it. All right. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm excited. Yeah. Jason got to do this with you last time, Gary, and so this is my turn, and we're going to cover... We've never done this before. We've, We've not. We've never talked together before. We've not. So, yeah. This could be my... So how bad my, could this go? I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I do think we ought to pray. And, yeah, yeah. and then, we'll, then we'll jump in, okay? Let me pray for us. And then I'm going to turn it over to Gary and be his sidekick tonight, okay? Father, we pause this evening and uh, are so grateful for these weeks that we've had together this semester to just dig into your word and just see how amazingly complex it is, uh, but God, how every verse points uh, to, to Jesus. And uh, what, a, what a rich treasure it has been to get to uh, just see all of the ways that, that Scripture shouts His name uh, and just points to uh, your heart, um, to the beauty of the gospel, to the power of the gospel, uh, showing us your sovereign plan from before the foundations of the universe. And so we marvel uh, at what we have learned. But God, my prayer uh, in week 13 is the same as it was in week one. God, that this would be more than just... Um, intellectually stimulating for us, uh, something that we leave just in awe of uh, having learned, but God, that it would be something that we, uh, from this day forward, we, we are no longer the same. God, we read your word differently. Mm -hmm. We apply it differently to our lives, and God, we are um, your ambassadors uh, into the lives of others that you've placed in our lives, and we use your word in a way maybe that we've never been able to before. Uh, to express who you are and what it is uh, that you have, you have done for us. So even this evening, God, would you continue to teach us uh, through your Holy Spirit? Would you uh, reveal truth to us and apply it deep to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been doing threads, right? And we've been talking about things that go all the way through the Scriptures because everything in Scripture leads to Christ, points to Christ. And so we've done a number of threads walking through that, and tonight's our final one, and it is shepherd. So we're going to look at shepherds, because the presence of shepherds is a major thread throughout the entire Bible, uh, particularly the awaiting and arrival of the one true good shepherd. Anybody guess who that is? Jesus, that's right. So we're going to get there. But before we explore this thread on shepherd, it's probably a good idea to consider the nature of sheep. I mean, what are they like? And the nature of shepherds. What's their job description? What do they do? 
So we're going to look at those two things first, and we'll get into Scripture. So first, the nature of sheep. So sheep, a single sheep, is incredibly valuable and an expensive sacrifice. You know, sheep were used to make sacrifices in the temple, at the altar, very expensive. Right. So need a lot of care. And they're productive. So they provide wool. They provide sheepskin. You can make curtains out of them. Leather. Uh, their horns can be a container for oil. Or they can be musical instruments. And they can be food. So very valuable to have. And, and uh, they, but they have a lot of needs. Caring for sheep, that's, that's a full-time job because they need food. They need to be led to good pasture for food. They need water, so you lead them to quiet waters, still waters. And if not watched carefully, they're prone to wander. And so to lose a sheep, wow, you got to find that one because they're valuable. They're very susceptible to predators. And so scripture talks about that. So when you see a shepherd, you're looking to find a good pasture for them, lead them there. You're taking care of them. You're finding water for them. You're watching over them. You're putting them in the sheepfold in the evening. And you're just caring for them. And they depend upon a shepherd. A shepherd to gather them together, to lead them, to guide them to the pasture, to provide care and protection and find them when they stray away from the flock. Have so, you seen that? Um, it, it's a video, I saw it on social media, of, of a modern day shepherd down in this ditch, like working to get this sheep out of this ditch. And he finally gets it out of the ditch and the sheep takes off running down this, this little bank and it just jumps right back down in the ditch again uh, in about 50 yards away from where he went in the first time. And so... I, when you were thinking about the nature of sheep, that's, that's the first picture that comes to my head, yeah. uh, is the shepherd. Um. <laughs> and spoiler alert, God calls us sheep. <laughs> yeah, we are sheep. So what about shepherds? What are they like? What do they do? Well, they're responsible for everything about the sheep. They're responsible to find pasture. They're responsible to, to provide shelter. They're responsible to lead them to water to protect them from predators and thieves and weather, and to mitigate the tendency of sheep to wander away from the flock, to go astray. They're also equipped for this caretaking. In fact, a uh, shepherd carries a rod and a staff to protect the sheep, to poke the sheep along, and they train the sheep to know them. They train the sheep to hear their voice and recognize them. So for the most part, a shepherd's long days are very lonely. They're out there in the field with the sheep, and it's lonely. They're by themselves. Sometimes there's other shepherds around, but it's a lonely life. And so one thing the shepherds did was they entertained themselves by talking to the sheep. And in talking to the sheep, the sheep could learn their voice and recognize their voice. There's a great story in this, this uh, devotional that, uh, that Daniel loaned to me while shepherds watch their flocks. And there's a story in here about a family, that, the, uh, this is a real family, the Arefs. And so Mrs. Aref was one who cared for their 45 sheep in their flock. And here's a story that she shared. One day, to her immense distress, Mrs. Aref lost track of one of her ewes, one of her sheep. So there's one lost. Uh, because sheep regularly mingle with other flocks at common pastures, during the day she checked with her neighbors to see if the ewe had gone home with someone else. But none of them had that missing little ewe. So she inquired among, uh, to distant neighbors to find them over the next week. No one had noticed astray. Weeks turned into months without a sign of the missing you. Then one day, two months later, a large flock came through the village led by a hired shepherd. As was her habit, Mrs. Ref asked the young man if he had come across a lost sheep. And listen to this. 
as the words passed her lips, one of the ewes in the solid pack of passing sheep lifted her head, immediately recognizing the sound of her voice. This is two months later. And the sheep knew her voice. Mrs. Resch screamed with delight, rushed through the startled mass to embrace her lost sheep. It didn't take long before the whole village heard about this commotion. Her flock was complete again. So training the sheep to hear the voice of the shepherd was an important responsibility because they could listen to that voice, recognize their shepherd. And a shepherd had to be prepared to suffer and sacrifice for the sake of the life of the sheep. Now, there's a few different types of shepherds. There's the good shepherd, and the good shepherd fulfills all these responsibilities carefully. There's the hired hand, just find somebody to watch the sheep for a while. Well, they're going to run if there's danger or difficulty. They're going to run away. And then there's bad shepherds, and the bad shepherds care for themselves, right. not for the sheep. Well, what does all this have to do with the Bible? How do we get to the thread? Both sheep and shepherds are powerful metaphors that scripture uses to describe God's relationship with his people and his plan of salvation. All right, so who are the shepherds of God's flock of sheep? Who are they? Well, first, God himself. And people that he specifically calls to be shepherds of his flock. So early in the biblical narrative, we see the specific call of shepherds, ones who at great personal sacrifice guide and care for God's flock. And that becomes a powerful metaphor used in Scripture to refer to two things. One, who should lead the flock? And this includes priests and prophets and kings who are called shepherds, and after Jesus' ascension, pastors and elders who shepherd the flock of the church. And the second thing is how these shepherds should lead the flock, how the people of God should be led. In fact, we see in Scripture vocational shepherds, shepherds who watch actual sheep, the animals, uh, and they are men who actually tended those flocks of sheep and at times fit the job description that God desires for a shepherd. And we're going to look at a couple of those. First, Moses. Moses was tending flocks for his Midianite father-in-law, and God called him from that to free the Israelites from Pharaoh, to deliver them to the promised land, and to function as a prophet. And then there's David. David was a shepherd, a shepherd of the flocks of his father, Jesse. When God called him through Samuel to be the king of Israel. So if you're a shepherd of the flocks, that's a pretty good job description, a pretty good task for somebody that God can use. That's right. right? Yeah, so let's, let's shift a little bit, right? We've, we've kind of just defined the, the picture a little bit of, of why, and you're, all, and, and I know you're smart, right? You're, you're, your mind is already connecting the dots. You've probably done this in the past as well of why God would use this imagery of sheep and, and shepherd and how that, how that correlates to, to us. But let's go ahead and make that shift to begin looking at how scripture now takes that picture and, and begins to help us understand, we can understand the whole thread of scripture through this a little bit. So let's think about how God designates himself as the shepherd. One of probably many of your favorite Psalms, if I were to ask you, uh, give me a favorite Psalm. For many, Psalm 23 would be high on that list, correct? Think of how it starts in verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, David says. David looks and says, listen, I was a shepherd, like you said, that was my occupation for my father. But David recognizes, just like I was a shepherd for sheep, the Lord is my shepherd. 
He is the one who leads me. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me to the waters to drink. He restores my soul, guides me in the path that I should, that I should take. The, another one of the psalmists in Psalm 77 says, you, talking to God, led your people like a flock by the hands of Moses and Aaron. So the psalmist, looking back at the Exodus, is, is saying that was like God was the shepherd leading his sheep, right, using Moses and using Aaron, but, but he was the one. He was the shepherd leading his flock. And he goes on in Psalm 78, it says, but he led his own people out of captivity in Egypt, how did he do it? Like sheep. He guided them in the wilderness like a flock. So we spent so many weeks with our threads and they, they seemed to just crisscross through the Exodus, didn't they? We kept coming back to that event. Well, we're coming back to it here too. And, and this picture, one of the things we're meant to see when we think about the children of Israel wandering through the wilderness, that it was God as a shepherd leading them right, to good pasture, to the place where they would be satisfied, where they could be fulfilled, right, where they could be in a land flowing with milk and honey so that he could bless them, right? But we're picking up in the middle of a story when we think about the Exodus because we can go back even further and we can think about some other people who were shepherds by occupation uh, that God used to begin to put together this flock that we read about in Exodus. Abraham was a shepherd, Isaac was a shepherd, and Jacob was a shepherd. And we've got some passages listed there for you, but even as we think about them and we think about the covenant that God made with Abraham, We've given you three passages there in Genesis 12, 13, and then again in 17. Think about the language that God uses in his covenant with Abraham where he says, I will make of you a great nation, right? A, a flock, right? I will make of you a great nation and I'm going to provide give you a land, right, that will be good for you and you will be fruitful and you will multiply and through your family, Abraham, through your flock, right, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. God then continues that, that covenant with his son, Isaac, and uses very similar language in chapter 26 of Genesis with that same kind of picture that, that you are going to multiply and that I'm going to provide for you like a shepherd. I am going to lead you and guide you, right, and, and provide for you so that as, as, as my people, right, I will be your God, you will be my people. And then even Jacob, right, God, God even continues to renew that covenant with Jacob in, in chapter 28 of Genesis but I love the picture. We get more detail of Jacob's life. And so if you think about the events uh, after he runs uh, away from his brother Esau and, and he meets uh, Laban, uh, he serves as a, like an under shepherd working for Laban, his deceptive, um, just kind of uh, conniving uncle. And, but as he does, Jacob really thrives in, in his role. God blesses him as a shepherd. And we see that. Uh, but from Jacob, we really see this covenant that God has made with his grandfather, Abraham, really begin to unfold because now Jacob has 12 sons, right? And those sons begin to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply. You know, and even I like what you put here, Gary, where it says like these 12 sons, as, as their families begin to grow and these tribes begin to form, Jacob's, Jacob kind of, his flocks begin to multiply through his children all the way to the point that one of his sons, right, who, as we saw Joseph in some of our other threads, as he is, you know, goes ahead by God's sovereign plan to Egypt, right, he is there to provide safety and pasture and care uh, for the survival of the entire entire family, right? God uses Joseph in that way to, to care for this promised seed of Abraham uh, and to continue his plan of using them. But that, that imagery of, of God being the one orchestrating this, like a shepherd leading his sheep to good pasture, protecting them every step of the way, right? Watching out for them, right? Abraham in Egypt, 
right? God, God watching out for him. Isaac, you know, in Egypt with Abimelech, God is watching out and protecting. Jacob, time after time, God is stepping in, even when Jacob is not so deserving of, of that protection, right? That God is still leading and guiding and protecting like a, like a shepherd. So God, looking at this in that way, God designates himself from the very beginning as we pick up the story in scripture at, at fulfilling this role of, of shepherd. Yeah, and, and it's interesting along with, you know, with building out the, the flock of his people, as they make those journeys, also getting flocks of sheep. Yeah. So he leaves, as they leave Egypt, they get a flock of sheep, a flock of sheep, so they're growing in, the, in even the sheep. Well, uh, things kind of turn bad um, for the Israelites, for God's flock, because yeah, they're down in the land of Goshen, doing well, and then new Pharaoh comes along, doesn't and know then they become in captivity. Um, and so uh, what God does, he raises up now some good shepherds. And one is Moses. That's right. So Moses is going to be a good shepherd. And did you, we don't think about that, right? When we talked about Moses, while, while Gary gets wired back up here, yeah. when, we, when we talk about Moses, um, you know, we, we talked about him as, as a prophet, right? That there would come a prophet like Moses. Remember when we, when we had that thread of the prophet and we, we looked at that, that picture that there would be one like Moses? But even in that role, think about how Moses functioned on a day-to-day -day basis leading, leading the people, right? In many, many ways, like a shepherd, right? Following, following God's guidance and his leadership, but then caring for a very obstinate, very stubborn, hard-headed, difficult people who were prone to wonder at the slightest uh, you know, inkling of, of trouble, right? And so Moses' task for those, those 40 years uh, was, was, a, was a tall task in, uh, for, for any shepherd, right? Yeah. So. So let's walk through how, how that happened. So first Moses, so he's in Egypt. Um, he's doing really well, but suddenly he comes upon an Egyptian that's, that's beating upon one of the Hebrews. And so he decides to take matters and he kills the Egyptian and that's found out. So he has to flee because now Pharaoh, he was of Pharaoh's household, wants to kill him. So he flees Egypt. He heads to uh, the land of Midian and, uh, and it's there that he becomes a shepherd of sheep. So here's Exodus 2.15. Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. He's in the witness protection program now. <laughs> hiding out. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came to draw water and fill the troughs of water uh, to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came these are not good shepherds, and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them. He defended them and watered their flock. And they said to their father, an Egyptian man rescued us from the shepherds and drew water for us and watered the flock. And that results in Moses becoming a shepherd because that father-in-law, Jethro, takes him on as a shepherd. Now Moses is shepherding the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, Exodus 3, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert, and he comes to the mountain of God. And now everything's gonna change for his life. So Moses is gonna turn from becoming a man on the run, hiding from Pharaoh, now a shepherd of sheep, to becoming a shepherd of God's people. And God had planned for this. He knew it. So while tending Jethro's sheep, the Lord calls Moses to shepherd his flock, his people, those descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And here's what God says to him. This is Exodus 3.10. Now, now, now come, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Really? The one who was trying to kill me? <laughs> so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So if you ever think that you're off in the wilderness and God has no use for you, you may be surprised. 
because that's where Moses was. But Moses is reluctant. Um, so Moses says, this is chapter 4 in Exodus, what if they will not listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what's in your hand? He said, a staff, that shepherd's staff. And God shows him how he can use that staff to convince Pharaoh and the people that God has sent him. He says, you will also take in your hand this staff, which will do the signs, the signs that show that you are my shepherd that I'm sending to free my people. And so Moses does that. The Exodus happens. They flee from Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. Moses takes them through all that. Um, and they head into the wilderness. And from there, Moses spends those next 40 years shepherding God's people from Egypt, across the sea, into this wilderness, with a plan of going into the promised land that was, that was promised to Abraham. But these are complaining and very rebellious people. So they're not just sheep that kind of wander off. These are sheep that grumble. Uh, these are sheep that want to get back to Egypt. How ridiculous is that? As much as they were being persecuted. But he takes this complaining, rebellious people through the wilderness to the good pasture, the promised land. That was the promise to the offspring of Abraham. And there's a lot of the characteristics of the sheep that Moses tends to, as a shepherd does, through his 40 years in the wilderness. First, he's got to find and provide them water. And shortly after they're in the wilderness, they start grumbling and complaining. And Moses, Moses takes them to a place and God provides water. He's got to provide, find and provide food for them. They're grumbling and complaining about that. And God provides them manna, which they also grumble and complain about. He's got to teach them. Remember the voice that the sheep need to hear. And God tells them, and Moses says, listen to the voice of God. Not just my voice, but the voice of God. And in fact, at that first place where, where uh, they find water, God tells them, I'm testing you. And he says, if you will carefully listen to my voice, the voice of the Lord your God, do what is right. Listen to all my commands. Keep your path straight. Keep all my statutes. If you'll just do that, a glorious life in the pasture that we're headed to. So Moses has to also instruct them to become followers of the Lord their God. And so he, the Lord gives through Moses all this instruction, all the laws, all the way they're supposed to live, all the ways they're supposed to be holy, all the ways they will demonstrate to others that he is the one true God. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And Moses also has to address their rebellion and their denial. So comes a time where God's ready to take them to the promised land. They send the spies. They come back and say, great place. Oh, but there's these giants there. So they rebel. They don't want to go. And what does God do? Well, okay. This generation is going to stay here for 40 years until the next generation comes. And they'll go. And Moses has to deal with that. And then finally, he leads them to the edge of the promised land. What a sacrifice. Can you imagine that Moses probably just wanted a nap after that 40 years? <gasps> Some rest, Lord, take these people. <laughs> Thank you. I'm done with them. Right? Well, Moses also had to plea for them. Remember the incident with the golden calf in Exodus? Moses is off on the mountain, he's off on Mount Sinai, he's getting the instruction of the law from the Lord to bring down to them, he's there for a long time. They get anxious and nervous and they're beginning to, you know, to scatter brain themselves and so they, they uh, throw this gold into the fire and it turns into a calf and they begin to worship that. So the sin of the golden calf, the sin of idol worship, that rebellion while Moses is receiving the instruction they're supposed to listen to, that happens. What does Moses do? 
He pleads for the sheep because God wants to destroy them and start over. So plea number one is, Lord, don't destroy the flock. Don't destroy your flock. He acknowledges this is God's flock. Exodus 32, you see that. Plea number two, because God's thinking, well, I'm not going to go with you. Moses, you, you take them. And Moses pleads to God, you must go with us, please. Acknowledgement that God must lead his flock. Moses will take them, but God must lead them. And he prays for that. If your presence doesn't go with us, please don't even lead us from here. Go with us. So Moses, a good, good shepherd in all these ways, he only made one mistake, and that was they were complaining at water at Meribah, and Moses gets angry, and he takes his staff, and he hits the rock in anger. You rebels! He's angry at them. And that, because he didn't honor God's holiness, kept Moses from being able to go into the land. He gets to see it, but he couldn't continue to shepherd them anymore. And so, what does God do? Moses says, Lord, they need a shepherd. They need somebody. I can't go, but they need one. And the Lord says, Joshua, he'll be the shepherd. So you see this in Numbers 27, Joshua takes over and becomes the shepherd, taking them into the promised land. And the flocks begin to settle there, these 12 flocks, which are really one flock, but the 12. And though they're separate from one another, in fact, three or two and a half stay on the other side, right? Uh, They're one flock, but they begin to become 12 flocks. Um, And after Joshua's death, the flock begins listening to the voice of other, other shepherds, false shepherds, other gods, and they forget God. That next generation after Joshua, when he dies, they forget who God is. And the flock is now spiritually scattered. In fact, you see at the end of the book of Judges, everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. They are no longer God's flock or behaving as God's flock. They're now just scattered sheep all over. And then the sheep demands their own shepherd. We want a king. We want a king for us. We want our own shepherd. And Saul comes. And Saul fails miserably. Things look really bad for the flock, but God provides a good shepherd. Yeah, and really this would be one of the most uh, famous shepherds that we read about in Scripture, right? When we think of David, we think of his beginnings as a shepherd boy, right? All of our, our study as children, especially in the Old Testament, we read of David as a shepherd boy. Um, and, but just like we could see Moses select, or God selecting Moses for this role, this role of shepherding his people, we can so easily see that in the life of David, that God, God has selected David for this role. And that we see that in 1 Samuel, right after the failed king Saul, uh, Samuel is distraught, right? And he goes into mourning and, and depression over the failures of Saul as king of Israel. And God says, Samuel, get up. Why are you, why are you sitting there? moping around, get up and go. And I've got another that I want you to anoint as the next king of Israel. (coughs) Excuse me. And so he sends Samuel to the house of Jesse, right? And Jesse parades all of his sons across in front of Samuel, right? The, The tallest and the oldest and the most talented, right? The most athletic, the strongest, all of these, he keeps parading. And each time Samuel's like, that must be it. And God's like, no, Samuel, that's not it. That's not him. That's not him. Finally, Samuel looks at Jesse and says, are there any more? Do you have any other sons? And Jesse goes, yeah, one more, but you don't want him. He, he's out there with the sheep. And he says, bring him, right? And so in chapter 16, he comes in and God tells Samuel, that's, that's the one. That is the one that I have chosen to be king of Israel this shepherd boy, right? And quickly we see when we get to the next chapter, David is on the scene again in chapter 17, and we see that David's on the job training as a shepherd boy. Really, God uses that 
mightily in this incredible narrative of David and Goliath. Right when, when the whole army of Israel, including Saul, who scripture tells us was head and shoulders taller than everybody else, like he is the one, we are meant to see, he is the one who should have st- stepped forward and said, I will accept Goliath's challenge, I will fight him. But the one who is strongest, most trained, is the weakest at the back saying, anybody else gonna volunteer for, for the assignment to go fight Goliath? And who steps forward? the shepherd boy. And he even tells Saul, Saul looks at him like, who are you? You can't do this. And David says, hey, I've been training for this my whole life, right? If, if I were going to paraphrase that, right? I've been doing, I've been getting ready for this my whole life. I've fought bears and, and I fought lions and all of these dangers that were, that were coming after my sheep, that threatened my sheep. You know, God is, I've, 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 I've faced the, I faced death in the eye, right? And I have defeated it because God was with me, right? And just like I defeated the bear, just like I defeated the lion, right? I'll defeat this giant. He's nothing, right? Because God is with me and how dare he defy the armies of the God, the one true God of Israel. And so David steps forward because he sees a flock. In many ways, he sees the flock that is, is in danger. Um, uh, he sees a people who are allowing the name of the Lord to be mocked by this uh, idol-worshiping giant. And David says, not on my watch, right? That, that's not gonna happen. And so we see the shepherd boy using that training to step forward and, and he demonstrates this, this trust in the Lord and God wins a victory uh, through David in, in the life of his people, Israel. Uh, but, but his shepherding skills come, come into play in this story, but they continue to do so, right? When, when um, after many years of David running from his life and dodging spears with King Saul, um, Saul dies in battle, he and his sons, and David uh, becomes the next king of Israel. But we see the people coming to David in 2 Samuel chapter 5, and it says, verse 2, previously Saul was king over us. You were the one. You were the one who led Israel out and in. They're recognizing, yes, Saul had the title, but David, you've been the, you've been the one that God has been using all along. And, and the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people, Israel, and you will be a leader over them. And so all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, to David, and made a covenant with him before the Lord in Hebron. And they anointed David king over Israel. And so now we see this, this picture, right? And we've, we've traced this uh, off and on uh, over this whole semester. So we see now this, this nation that was so scattered and so splintered, right? All through the book of Judges, right? Um, and then the first king is such a failure, right? And so we see this, this nation that is just, uh, just in turmoil and, and is so vulnerable to, to the enemies, right? To the threats around them. They are not thriving in the land by any, by any stretch. Now God raises up this shepherd king, right? Who will unify them. They come to him and say, you be our king. And David, right? God uses his military might, right? This, this heart that he has to protect his people and to protect the name of God. And he uses David to defeat the enemies and to drive them out and to provide safety and security and even prosperity for the flock of God and David ushers in what is, you know, looked at as the golden age of the kingdom of Israel while David is on the throne. And so we see him being used by God in that way. But just like we've seen so many times as we've looked at these threads, right? A prophet, but the prophet has, is this the prophet, right? Is this the one, right? That is gonna be like Moses that will truly come right, with a, this message from the Lord, or a king, is this the king, right, is this, is this the one? The same thing is true here. We look at David, surely this is the shepherd who has come to lead, but, but we see David's failure just like Moses, right? Moses fails ultimately, David's failure. We begin to see the kingdom 
begin to, you know, the, the sheep are now threatened once again. And we see David's son uh, tempt and even successfully for a season usurp the throne. Uh, but it's all because of, of David's, his sin, right? Even as a shepherd looking out for his own interest instead of what was best for, for his flock. Um, and so we see David, he's not the one either, right? We, we're meant to see that in this story. All right, but, the, but God continues to use him. I think that's an incredible picture of, of God's grace uh, to continue to use David uh, in spite of his flaws and in spite of, despite his, his failures and his shortcomings. God continues to use David even to the point that even in the midst of David's sin, David is still pleading on behalf of his people to say, God, would you spare them? Right? Would you, in, in, in 2 Samuel, right, where David's sin causes God to have to punish the people, David steps forward and says, God, would you relent from, from this plague? And, and he steps forward again as a, as a shepherd, right, looking out for the sheep. And God relents um, and, and spares, spares the, uh, the people there. So, so the life of David we see as, as a shepherd too, but all of this we're seeing like Moses and like David, right? This care, this protection, this leading, this, this provision for the people. But all along the way, we're meant to see, but something isn't quite right, right? The flock is still in need of something that these shepherds have not possessed, that they have not provided for the sheep. Um, and so we, we see that even in the good shepherds, but there's a whole season in the Old Testament of, of bad shepherds that we've got to take a minute to look at as well. Yeah, and it pretty much happens right away. So David finishes his, his shepherding, um, and even Scripture, Psalm 78 says, he was a good shepherd. He shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart, guided them with skillful hands. And he has his son Solomon that becomes the next king. And Solomon starts out well. He's praying for God to give him wisdom to lead the people. He knows how challenging it's going to be to lead this entire nation of of Israel, and he prays, starts out well, but one bad turn. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, Scripture says, turned away from the Lord. And then, after Solomon, two flocks. The one flock that David was able, as a shepherd king, was able to pull together, that God used him to pull together, splits in half. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom split. You've got northern Israel, you've got southern Judah, and now you've got this competition between kings going on and on and on. Evil kings rise up, occasionally a good king, but lots of evil kings who lead the people away from the Lord. And so you've got many, 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 many bad shepherds. And we're, but we're not just making up that language, are we, by saying the kings are shepherds. That's the language God uses yeah. Uh, yeah. when he is evaluating the roles of these kings. Yeah, we'll see that in just a second. So you've got a procession of evil kings. The rulers are shepherds. You've got prophet-seeking priests we talked about that back when we covered priests, how this period was difficult for the priests to perform as they were supposed to during the time of the Exodus that was set up. And you've got false prophets. And they're violating their calling. They're supposed to be leaders that help, help lead the sheep, focus them on God. They violated their calling by leading the flocks away from God into unsafe, idle worship. And God's going to punish that. So you have one bad turn, Solomon, two flocks, many, 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 many bad shepherds, and finally two exiles. God's going to bring his judgment down on these shepherds and on the sheep. So the flock of the northern kingdom goes into exile, and then the southern kingdom flock goes into exile. And they're preyed upon to get to exile by powerful nations that are going to take them to their sheepfolds. Um, 
And so you've got to ask the question at this point. What happened to, where are the good shepherds? Are there any? Well, over and over through the prophets, you see God say no. Isaiah 56, he condemns the shepherds. Jeremiah 2, Jeremiah 10, Jeremiah 23, condemning the shepherds. Zechariah, condemning the shepherds. Hosea, condemning the shepherds. You see it in every prophet in the Old Testament. And here's Ezekiel 34 too. Listen to this. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Here's how they've been behaving. Remember I gave you those three categories? This is the worst. These are the bad ones. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, this is what the Lord says. Woe, shepherds of Israel, who've been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The disease you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you searched for loss, but with force and violence you've dominated them. Evil, evil, evil. This is what the Lord says, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them. I'm taking them back because none of them are good. But there's hope, right? And we've seen this as, we, as we've looked uh, through multiple, multiple threads through the Old Testament, right? Even in the midst of the warning, even in the midst of the punishment, right? As we even looked at the thread of marriage and we saw that the exile, God is saying to, to, to Israel, I am divorcing you, right? But, but I'm going to establish a new covenant where I will marry you again, right? So there's always this hope that God is on the throne and God is working. So even with these indictments against the evil shepherds, the evil kings and religious leaders, the priests in Israel that were leading the people astray. Uh, there's hope. And, and look at Jeremiah chapter 23, because there's a promise that God makes even in the midst of, of an indictment. He says, woe to the shepherds in verse one, who are causing the sheep of my pasture to perish and are scattering them. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You've scattered my flock and you have driven them away, causing them to be dispersed and driven into exile. And you have not been concerned about them, right? They're not being good shepherds. So he says, behold, I'm going to call you to account for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. But I'm thankful for verse three. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and I'll bring them back to their pasture and they'll be fruitful and they'll multiply, right? What does that language take us back to? It goes back to the garden, right? We see it in the covenant God made with Abraham that, they will be, that he, he will be the father of a great nation and they'll be fruitful and multiplying. So God says, I'm gonna keep my promise, right? I'm gonna bring them back. I myself am going to be their shepherd. Verse four, I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend for them. They will tend to them and they will not be afraid any longer, nor will they be terrified, nor will any be missing declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Remember that when we looked at the king, this righteous branch, who is the righteous branch? It's Jesus, right? He says, I will raise up and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Ezekiel picks up this promise of a coming shepherd who we know to be Jesus. He says that I will appoint over them one shepherd, my servant, David. Well, the problem, if we think of this, well, he's talking about King David. No, he's not talking about King David because Ezekiel is writing after King David is, is dead and gone. So who is he referring to? This righteous branch that comes from the line of David. And he says, and this, this servant, my servant, this one true shepherd will feed them and he will be their shepherd. 
Micah picks up this prophetic language too of this coming shepherd. He says, but in you, Bethlehem, even though you're too little among the clans of Judah, no one thinks you're significant, but from you, one will come forth for me to be ruler. He will arise, verse four, and he will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. So even in the midst of exile, even in the midst of Israel having to suffer the consequences of their rebellion, right? Their, their worship of other idol, of idols, God says, but I'm still working, right? And, and I am going to send the shepherd that you need who will tend to you, who will care for you and protect you and provide for you. And he will rise up in verse five and he will be the peace, right? That you need the rest that we just saw last week. Yeah, and so finally, 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 the arrival of the one good shepherd, Jesus. So let's look at a few passages to help us understand what that, that meant when he came. First, Matthew proclaims that the prophecy has been fulfilled. The prophecy of Jeremiah, the prophecy of Ezekiel, the prophecy of Micah, and others of the coming shepherd. And Matthew records that when he gives the story of the Magi telling Herod where this king has been born. They said to him, Herod, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. He's quoting Micah. And you, Bethlehem, from you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. The Magi says, he's being born in Bethlehem. And then we've got the account in Luke of the birth, the birth of the prophesied shepherd. And guess who gets to see him? Good, watchful shepherds. Shepherds. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Boy, I should get the Linus spotlight right now, right? <laughs> Let me get you, you a blue blanket. There? Yeah. yeah, from... You want a blue blanket? Okay. Anyway, and an angel of the Lord... When the angels had departed from them, the shepherds began to say to one another, let's go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened. So the shepherds are going to see the good shepherd. What the Lord has made known to us, they understand it was revealed to you by the Lord. When they had seen him, they made, oh, we're cheering back there for the shepherd. Oh, this is wonderful. When they see him, they made known the statement which had told him about this child, and all who heard it, the testimony of these shepherds, was amazed by the things which had been told them by these shepherds. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God, for, for they'd all heard and seen just as they had been told. The shepherds, these shepherds out watching over their flocks faithfully, got to come see the, the birth of the, the true one shepherd. true shepherd. Um... Remember the scattering of the people without a shepherd? Jesus observed that. Matthew tells us this story. He's going through all the cities and villages. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's preaching uh, to the crowd. He's healing uh, diseases and sicknesses. And when he sees the crowds, he felt compassion for them, Matthew tells us, because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Then he told his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, plead to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest. He wants the sheep brought to him. Where are the shepherds? The indictment this gives against the Jewish leaders who are supposed to be shepherding them, and yet Jesus sees that's not happening. Send out workers. Bring them to the good shepherd. And then in John 10, we hear him tell it who he is. I am the good shepherd. He announces that. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's going to do that. And he talks about the hired hand who doesn't care for the sheep. And we know there's those around. And he says, I am the good shepherd and I know my own. I know my sheep. And my own know me. They can hear his voice, right? And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. And they will become one flock with one shepherd. 
everyone that comes to Christ will be of his one flock, <coughs> and he'll be their one shepherd. And he plans to lay down his life for them. That's when he goes to the cross. <coughs> so, like the good shepherds of the Old Testament that we heard about, let's build this thread backwards. So Jesus cares for the sheep of the flock, just like those good shepherds did. Just as the old shepherds works of the flock knew them, Jesus knows the flock, and they know him. And how is he different from those shepherds? Well, the Old, old Testament shepherds care for the flocks that God gave them. The flocks Jesus shepherds are his sheep. He calls them my sheep. Jesus calls for sheep that are not of this fold. In the Old Testament, they're just given the people of God, and occasionally people come and join them. But he's... He's, his flock is going to include Jews and Gentiles and people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. One shepherd, one flock. So we saw this progression, the flock kind of falling apart. Starts out with 12, becomes one, then gets scattered, <coughs> then becomes one again under David, then splits up into two. There's not two flocks. There's not 12 flocks. There's not a million flocks with churches all over the world. There's one flock. One flock of his sheep under one shepherd. Amen. That's what he declares. And Jesus is a spotless, sacrificial lamb. So he's not only the shepherd, he's the lamb who gives his life for the sheep on the cross. Amen? Amen. As the good shepherd, what does Jesus provide? Everything the sheep need. But guess what? Unlike the pasture, the water, the bread, the food, his provision is not temporary, it's eternal. Here's what Jesus says about himself. Remember, shepherd finds food. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, the living bread that came down from heaven. And anyone who eats this bread will live forever. Eternal life. That's his bread. Water. He meets the woman at the well and tells her, whoever drinks of this water I give him will never be thirsty. But the water I give him will become a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. Not just a still water pond, but eternal life. And then he tells, right before he says, I'm the good shepherd, he tells the people, I am the door of the sheep. He's giving them protection and pasture. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came so they would have life and have it abundantly. Eternal life. Eternal life, eternal life. I can't leave this part without saying, maybe for someone in here, that's tonight. Coming to the good shepherd because in him he provides eternal life. He gave his life as a spotless lamb, as a sacrifice for you and for me. He's the good shepherd. Amen. That's right. So that image just, it just comes into focus, doesn't it? My sheep know my voice, right? This loving care of a shepherd that says, come to me and in me you will have rest. You will have everything that you need. It is, it is in me. I am that provision, right? So we see that he is the one true good shepherd, but we can look after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, right? Before he ascends to heaven, he gives commands. He gives instruction about what we are to do until he returns, amen? All right, what does he say to Peter in John 21 when he is restoring Peter back to service after Peter thinks he has, you know, failed beyond repair what does Jesus say to Peter after he's, every time, do you love me? Peter's response is, you know I love you. What does Jesus tell Peter to do? 
feed my sheep, right? This picture, Peter, your job, I know you were a fisherman, right? I called you to be a fisher of men, right? But from this point forward, I'm calling you to feed my sheep, right? That, that is your job. And that language is picked up all through Acts and it's picked up through the epistles, right? We see this imagery that, that the leaders, that pastors, right? Even the word itself means shepherd. But we see this picture here in Acts chapter 20, right? Where, where Paul is addressing the elders, the church leaders in Ephesus. He says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among you, right? Which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Why? Why has he made you an overseer of the flock? So you can shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood, Right? The church, this flock, this, this body of believers, they belong to him. He has laid down his life to redeem them, to bring them into the fold. And he says to these church, to these leaders, hey, your job is to be my under shepherd, right? To care for the sheep that I have purchased with my blood. Verse 31, so be on alert, remembering that night and day, right? I did not... Paul's saying, I did not cease to admonish each one of you, right? Even with tears. He's, Paul's saying, I served as a shepherd. I was watching out for you. I was watching for false teachers. I was watching for those who would distort the gospel, right? And as a good shepherd, I protected you from following a path that could have led to destruction for you. So Paul is using that. He says, I'm watching you like a shepherd. Peter, right? Jesus addresses Peter, feed my sheep. You think Peter's thinking about that when he writes his letter here in chapter five, verse one, when he says, I urge you to the elders, to the leaders among you as your fellow elder, right? You're in witness of the sufferings of Christ and one who is a fellow partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. He says, no, now I'm urging you, right? I'm one of you, but here's what we are to be doing. Shepherd the flock that is among you. Right, and then verse four, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that never fades away. Right, so there is this incredible picture that we see as we think about the church and how the church is to function, right? As we, as we are being faithful to, to carry the gospel, right, to the ends of the earth, uh, to, to go into all the world, to make disciples as we are doing that. We are to do that with this mentality like, like a shepherd, like an under shepherd of the true shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. That is what we are to do. You know, and even the word I mentioned in Mingo, the word, there's three words used in the New Testament for the office of a pastor. The one that is used the most is the word shepherd, right? Poimain. That is the word that is used most to describe that office and that function. Why? Think about why that would be. Because it expresses the, the heart of God of what we are called to do, yeah. to feed, to care for, right? To lead, to protect the body of Christ, right? His bride, as we saw just a couple of weeks ago. So this idea is so important that that even the leaders within our local churches, their job is to serve in this role of a shepherd, right? Under the authority and under the leadership of Jesus as the true good chief shepherd. So that's, that's the call, right? That's the yeah. picture. That's the thread that we chase. But man, we can make, while we've got a couple of minutes, just a little bit of application about why this is important. What are, what are some truths about this that, that we need to understand, Gary? Yeah, so one is uh, um, to uh, keep your eyes on the good shepherd. When you're studying scripture, keep your eyes on the good shepherd and uh, know that he is continuing to gather his flock and through our witness for him, the Holy Spirit can draw sheep into his flock. That's one. Yeah, know his voice, right? Yeah. My sheep know my voice. Listen, yeah. listen to his voice, right? Tune in to, to his voice. You isn't know, it, I think it, Isn't it wonderful that, uh, that this church is very committed to preaching the gospel? Preaching the gospel so people can, can 
hear about the good shepherd who gave his life for them yeah. and hear his voice. That's right. You know, I think this picture of, of, of the shepherd, of Jesus as the chief shepherd, right, that language being used all through scripture, it just points to the character of God. When I read this devotion the first time, I was amazed at just the investment a shepherd makes. It is not an easy job. It is, it is difficult. It is a 24-7 job. It is a messy job. Um, it is a tiring job. But it is... But I was blown away when this guy, he went and lived with shepherds for like a year. He lived with Bedouins um, all over in the Middle East and then he wrote about it. And the thing he came away with more than anything was saying, even though it was one of the hardest jobs on the planet, he said they loved it. He said they loved, they knew, they named their sheep. Even these shepherds who had hundreds and even thousands of sheep in their flock, they actually name them and they know them. They can, they can just feel their head even in the dark and they know which sheep it is just by the, by the feel. Oh, that one's got a knot. So this one, I know which one this is. I mean, there is an intimacy between the shepherd and the sheep. Do you think that's an accident that God would say, I I'm the good shepherd, right? That that's the beauty of the gospel is that he is near, Right, that Jesus, he is Emmanuel, he is God with us, right? A good shepherd has to be with his sheep. He can't turn that job over to somebody else. He is there, he is present, he is with the sheep. And I think yeah. that's one of the big things we learn from this thread is, is we just get to marvel and be in awe of the character of God yeah. um, that, that he picked that picture uh, to tell us something about his own heart yeah. for, for us. And uh, I would say, Pray for the under shepherd right here. Pray for our pastor, yeah. our shepherd. I mean, he's been called here by God to care for this flock, to teach this flock, to lead this flock. Um, and we need to pray for him and we need to listen to him. We need to pray for our pastor. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, it's... So... Yes, we're like sheep in many ways, <laughs> um, prone to wander. Um, but we can also consider one another in this flock and care for one another as a shepherd would. So we have that ability to be able to be on the watch, care for one another. And if you have a, if you have a home and you have children in your home, that's a flock. That's a flock to care for. To think about, um, gosh, God's given me this flock to help, help them know who he is. Help them know who the good shepherd is. To be an example in my home. And that's a 24-7 job too. <laughs> to care for them. Yeah. That they're fed. Yeah. That they're protected that they're in a good pasture. So yeah, we've got, we've got deacons in this yeah. room. We've got growth group leaders in this room, people who are serving in other ministries, children's ministry, youth ministry, right? You get to serve as, as an extension, <laughs> right, of, of that role to, to care for parts of our flock, right? To make sure that, uh, <laughs> that they're growing, that they're healthy spiritually, uh, that they're walking, that, they're, that their eyes are on the good shepherd, that they're listening to the voice of, of the good shepherd, right? So it's this privilege that we have as, as the body of Christ, as we edify one another, right? It, 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 it fits into this picture of, of what a shepherd does for the sheep, right? And, and we are the sheep, right? But we get to, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, we also get to serve the sheep, right? It's, it's a beautiful picture that we have uh, in, in this imagery that scripture gives us. Yeah. And if That's, you're feeling, feeling spiritually scattered, come talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we did it. Yeah. It's 7.45, 13 weeks. <laughs> this has been fun. I hope you've been blessed by it. Uh, I know we have been, um, and I know we'll do more of, of this kind of thing. And in the, new, 
New semester as the fall comes back, so be watching uh, as information rolls out later this summer of what's coming in the fall, but we'll have more opportunities uh, for discipleship and Bible study to happen on Wednesday nights as we, as we gather together, okay? So, uh, Gary, would you pray us out? Absolutely. Father, thank you so much uh, for your love for us. Thank you for your care for everyone in your flock. Thank you for the work that you're doing to draw others by your spirit. Uh, to hear the voice of the shepherd, to know what he's done for them. Thank you for your son. Lord, thank you for, um, thank you for the good shepherd that he was and is and will continue to be. Thank you for his giving his life for us. Father, may that be known by others. May we be faithful to him um, so that others will be drawn to him through us. Father, I pray for everyone in this room. You know them. Uh, you know them. You know every one of them. Father, you know what they need. Father, you know how they need to be led and protected and cared for. Father, you know their calling in this church and their calling to their families and their calling to the places that you've put them in. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them in what you would have them do for your flock and for their witness of you and your son and your spirit. And we pray all these things in the name of the one true good shepherd, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.